Good evening, friends, cozy crowd. We have about 30 and mounting uh, people on uh, logging in uh, by the internet, so um, we will have a successful evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. It's the first in a series of public talks hosted by the McMaster Health Forum as part of the Labarge Optimal Aging Initiative at McMaster. And this was made possible by Chancellor Labarge's very generous donation. I'm Susan, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Susan Denberg. I'm Associate Vice President in the Faculty of Health Sciences at McMaster. And it's been an honor and a privilege for me to oversee the Labarge Initiative through all its ambitious stages and components. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome our keynote speaker, Régin Hébert, founding scientific director of the CHR Institute of Health of Aging and former Minister of Health in Quebec. I'd also like to welcome Melody Miles, uh, CEO of our local Lynn's Community Care Act Access Centre, as well as Parminder Reina, who holds the Labarge Chair in Optimal Aging and Canada Research Chair in Geroscience. Both of them will provide remarks. I'd like to thank the organizers of the event um, who were critical in, pl in planning the series of talks, and there is a schedule that's been handed out to you, uh, guided by John Levis and Ilana Churia and other members of the organizing committee. McMaster University aspires to be the gateway to optimal aging. We have a number of complementary and collaborative initiatives, including the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, that are guiding McMaster towards a leadership position amongst Canadian institutions in the realm of aging research and knowledge translation. Our established expertise is growing and becoming more widely recognized, aided by the recent la launch of the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal, and you've just seen a wonderful cartoon. Tonight provides a unique opportunity to participate in a dialogue about home care, an issue of great relevance to the Canadian population and to hear experts in the field. I trust that the comments that you hear and that you yourself contribute will be the starting point for new conversations at the university, but also in your homes and in your communities. I'll now turn over to Mike Wilson, who's the Assistant Director of the Health Forum, who will introduce Dr. Eber. Thank you, Susan, and thanks to everyone who's uh, joined us tonight, our nice cozy crowd. Uh, I, I think we'll, we'll be having a great set of uh, talks tonight, and uh, thank you to all of you who've come, and also to the growing numbers who are joining us online. So I'm Mike Wilson, the Assistant Director at the McMaster Health Forum, and an Assistant Professor in the Department of Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics. So I have the pleasure tonight of introducing the agenda for you uh, in a talk by Réjean Hébert, who will be sharing with us about the need for action in Canada for improving home care. Um, so as Susan mentioned, tonight's the first in the series of uh, seven public talks we have planned here at McMaster Innovation Park between now and uh, early December uh, about a range of topics relevant to the theme of optimal aging. Um, so for those that are interested, we do have handouts uh, that list all of the events that we have coming up. And uh, so these events really touch on several important topics. For example, we have one coming up next week on Monday. Um, based, so with many of us now interested in seeking out health information online, we've planned a talk with Mike Evans, who um, is r relatively infamous for his uh, YouTube videos about a range of health issues, and he's had more than 10 million hits for these videos that he's posted on YouTube so far. Also, if you're like, a, like me and many others and are keen to be more empowered in, your, um, in making decisions about your health and health care, we're going to be joined by Sir Muir Gray, who will be speaking about that here on November 11th. So Muir was knighted in 2005 for pioneering Britain's fetal, maternal, and child screening programs and is really a dynamic and engaging speaker. So we're very excited to have him be able to come here and share with us. So the topic tonight about the need for action in Canada for improving home care builds on a citizen panel that we convened in August about meeting the future home and community care needs uh, for older adults in Ontario with, that we did at the McMaster Health Forum. <clears throat> so the outputs from that panel, a topic overview, a citizen brief that succinctly summarizes the available research evidence, and a summary of the key themes from that panel are all available on our website at the McMaster Health Forum. 
So, as I mentioned, we're very lucky to have Rajan join us tonight. Um, as Susan said, he's a former Minister of Health in, in Quebec and uh, was the original scientific director of the Institute of Aging at CIHR. Um, and so we also have Prem Reyna, who's going to be providing some remarks and introducing Rajan for us more formally in a second, as well as Melody Miles, who'll be, join, who'll be sharing some experiences with from the C Community Care Access Centres about um, coordinating care for patients in the community. Uh, so before I just turn it over to Parminder, just a few housekeeping issues. So first, just so that everyone knows, we will be taking photos throughout the session, and we're also filming the session too. Um, and also, I just kindly ask that everyone in the crowd, if you can turn off your cell phones or set them into silent mode, just to make sure that we're not interrupted by them. And then lastly, following um, Rajan's talk and the remarks from Parminder and Melody, we'll be opening up for questions from the crowd as well as online. So people will be hopefully submitting questions over Twitter and either Perminder or me will be uh, reading them out and then you can respond. So thanks and over to you, Perminder. Thanks, Mike. Um, I've known Rejean for many years now. Um, so I, I remember when Rejean first was appointed as a Minister of Health and I actually went to Halifax to present about our McMaster Optimal Aging Portal idea to all the ministers of health. And I had to ask uh, Rejan whether I should call him Honorable uh, Rejan Beer. He says, no, Rejan is fine. So I will continue with that uh, today. Um, Rejan uh, obtained his uh, uh, Doctor of Medicine degree from the University of Sher Sherbrooke in 1979 and a specialty degree in geriatric medicine in 1987. And he also has a diploma in gerontology uh, from Université des Sciences Sociales Grenoble. And uh, he received that in 1981, and then went on to do his uh, master's in epidemiology and in, in the area of uh, uh, dementia epidemiology at uh, Cambridge, Cambridge University um, uh, in 1994. And Rejean then uh, went on to become a dean of, uh, he, from 2004 to 2010, he is the Dean of Medicine at, uh, at uh, University of Sherbrooke, and he's a fellow of the Can Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. I can continue to talk about all the, uh, all the achievements that Rejean has had over his career, which will end up taking the whole night, so I will skip some of those. Uh, but I am personally delighted that Rejean was able to quickly respond to my email when I sent him about this uh, session and this lecture and within 20 minutes, we had actually an agreement that Rejan would uh, come and present and talk about this issue. And, and I think from my pers personal point of view, that's the type of person Rejan is, that he really engages in issues that are very close to his heart. And this whole issue of home care has been close to his heart for many years and continues to uh, push that. Uh, during the dinner tonight, uh, Rejan mentioned to me that he's going to be a uh, moving to Montreal and he's going to be professor at the University of Montreal and leaving the politics a little to the wayside for the time being and focus on health policy and health administration side of things. So without taking more time, I would like to welcome Reja Abir, uh, who's going to talk to us about uh, home care uh, and his ideas that he had proposed as a minister in Quebec and, and what that means for the rest of us. Reja. Thank you very much, Marminder. Thank you for this invitation. I'm very pleased to be here with you. Um, very pleased also to visit the coordinating center of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging because uh, the idea, this crazy idea of a longitudinal study came when I was uh, the scientific director of the Institute of Aging. So it's very, it's very interesting to see that it's, it's running. And I heard that uh, today uh, was announced the the new funding for prolonging the study, so it's, uh, it's good news. It's good news for Canada, and, and Parminder, congratulations for all, all you've done, uh, you've, you've been doing, and you will do uh, in, uh, with this study. I will share with you a new idea that is, uh, I think, uh, that is very important for, for a country that are facing uh, aging of their population, 
and it's a, a new way of funding uh, services for older people and handicapped people. And uh, we, are, we have to look at those new ideas, new innovation, because our population is aging. And with the aging of the population, there is a, a transformation of the, the kind of diseases we are facing. From uh, a young population we were in the last century with many acute diseases, mostly infectious diseases, we are moving to a, a, an aged population with uh, a lot of chronic diseases. So our healthcare system that was developed in the last century for dealing with acute diseases have to, 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 to be transformed to an healthcare system dealing with chronic diseases. So hospital that was the center of the system in the last century is no longer the center of the system. We have to move from an hospital center system to a community centered system because chronic diseases, people living with chronic diseases are not living in the hospital, they are living at home. And we have then to, uh, to provide them services at home, primary care services, access to primary care services. But before that, prevention, because most of the chronic diseases can be prevented by, by changing life, lifestyle, life habits. So it's very important to focus on prevention, on primary care. And because the, the home is a much more complex setting than a hospital to manage, we have to coordinate, to integrate the services. And we have also to provide services at home. So, so home care is fundamental to an aging population facing chronic diseases. I will not talk about the others, uh, the other uh, elements of the transformation of the health and social system. I will focus tonight on home care. But the others are also very important. What are we spending? in long-term care in Canada. We are spending around 1, 1.2% of the GDP. Uh, we are in the average of the uh, developed countries, but there are countries like Sweden and Netherlands who are doing much better. 3.5% of their GDP are spent for long-term care. But the problem is not what we spend. The problem is how we spend the money. In Canada, if you look at the public long-term care expenditures, we are spending only 14% of these expenses for home care. The rest is going to institutional care. 14% is the worst situation in the world. If we compare with France, who spend 43% of the long-term care expenses in home care, or Netherlands, 32, and Denmark, 73% of the long-term care expenses are going to home care. So what's wrong? Why are we underfunding home care in Canada? Home care is, in the words of every politician, you know, but not really in the action. If you look at the actual budget increase in home care, there is not really a major investment in home care in Canada, as I, as I show to you, only 14%. So there is a lot of words, but not actions. The problems come from the Canada Health Act. In the 70s, they define what, what was covered by the, uh, the health insurance by what was medically necessary. It was essentially hospital care and physician services. Not really home care. Home care is a, is a, is a, is a new, relatively new sector that is not included in the uh, Canada Health Act. The third point is that we, we developed very strong post-hospital home care. You know, because we decrease a lot the length of stay in the hospital 
And this new population, those new clients, in fact, bumped the long-term care people that was uh, getting services from the home care organization. In fact, this movement of uh, providing care in the home after the hospitalization literally decreased the budget for long-term home care. There was also no, not really good management tool to, to assess the needs of people and to be able to manage home care. And we developed in, in Quebec the SMAF and uh, the ISO SMAF profile, which is a kind of standardized evaluation of the needs of the disabilities and uh, a kind of case mix classification for uh, transforming those needs into management information. The other phenomenon was the, the merge of the institution we, we, we faced in Quebec, and it's not, uh, it's not finished because uh, the new Minister of Health announced a, a big merging uh, again of uh, the organization in Quebec. But those, those kind of merging of hospital with uh, nursing home and with community care, home care, induce, in fact, a phenomenon that hospitals get all the budget and that home care is not the priority for those organizations who are facing uh, waiting time for surgery and waiting time in the emergency room and all those problems that have that got the, the priority. So home care is, is always secondary in those big institutions and we have very strong data demonstrating that this phenomenon is acting, at least in Quebec. And uh, finally, we've, uh, th there are a lot of development in the uh, residential facilities, and in those residential facilities, people have to pay for their services. And there is really a two-tier system in Canada at the moment. Those who, who uh, can pay for their services and they get the services in their residential facilities and others who live at home and who have to, uh, to get a bit of services, in fact, 10 to 12 percent of the services needed funded by the public health care system, 10 to 12 percent only. The remaining is provided by the, the informal caregivers or by out-of-pocket expenses from private organizations. So what should we do? We have to really prioritize home care. And first of all, we have to, to refine the approach of home care. Home should be defined by where the, the people decide to live. If it's in a residential facilities, in, uh, in, uh, in a private home, it doesn't matter. Home care should provide services where people decided to live. These days, if you want to have services, you usually have to, to move toward an organization or a facility where the services are provided. We have to turn that around. We have to let people choose where they want to live and provide services where they live. That's another way of thinking about uh, services. And that's what people in Denmark have done over the last decades. And the public funding should be available what, wherever the milieu where people decided to live, whatever the caregiver is providing the care, and there should be a, a person's responsibility and, and accountability of people. Older people and handicapped people have to, to get back a basic freedom, two basic freedoms, in fact. The freedom to choose where they live, and second, the freedom to choose by whom they're going to be, they're going to they, have services, they're going to have support. And
and those two freedoms has been lost somewhere over the last decades. People no longer have the freedom to, uh, to select where they want to live and by whom they're going to be served. Second, we need a significant investment in home care. For the province of Quebec, it means $500 million a year. It's doubling the actual budget of home care. This will just get the response rate, the, the, the percentage of public services as opposed to the need of people. So it's, as I said, 8 to 10 percent at the moment. This increase in budget, this doubling in budget would, would put this percentage to 40 percent. It's not 100 percent, but it's a, it's a big step. And the part of long-term care budget would then move from 14%, as I showed you, to uh, 31%. But putting more money is not enough. If we really want a change, we have to change the, the financing structure of uh, long-term care by moving to a long-term care public insurance system, what I call an, an assurance autonomie, an autonomy insurance for ensuring that uh, people with disabilities could get the services they need from a public funding. And uh, I want to explain to you what is a, a long-term care public insurance. It's been implemented in many countries so far. First, the first one is in Netherlands in the, in the 60s, and you see that other European countries have developed some kind of long-term care insurance, and uh, Japan in 2000 and South Korea more recently have developed one. It, it's a kind of fifth risk after ensuring the retirement, the unemployment, the work accident and health, we should ensure uh, the long-term care. And it's been recommended in Quebec by a couple of provincial commissions and also by a Senate report uh, a, couple of, a couple of years ago. It's uh, putting the funding for long-term care as a right instead of a privilege like it is at the moment. It becomes a right. Like health was implemented as a, as a, as a right in the, in the 70s. You know, when you, you broke your leg, you have the right to get the services. When you become disabled, you should have the right to get the services. You should assess what, what's going to be the benefit by assessing the needs of the people and by providing uh, those benefits in kind by contract and by cash for care. I will come back uh, with uh, uh, more details on those three, three options. There should be a service plan, a service plan agreed by, by the older people and their caregiver. And there should be also a protected specific funding from that. Not the funding from the overall health funding, because we know that home care will always be the third or the, the fourth or the tenth priorities. Why not a private insurance? There's been a, a lot of study on that, and there is there is not really a market for private insurance in, in this sector. Uh, it's marginal, except in the States, and where it's been implemented, uh, the premium are very high, and uh, the, the coverage is, is very partial. You know, it covers uh, a very, very severe disability at the, end, at the end of life when the activities of daily living are already impaired, and it covered it for uh, a couple of years only, so it's not, it's not really a, a coverage. Because the, the risk is too high, you know, 70% of people will live 3 to 18 years with disabilities at some point. You will have, we will all have to live 3 to 18 years with disabilities at, at the end of our life. And the other problem is that the the, the consciousness of that risk 
arrive very late in life. You know, at 50, we are not conscious that we will be disabled at some point when we, we're going to age. So there is a lot of denial for that. There is a, a survey that shows that 50% of older people, people older than 65, think that they will never experience a functional decline. So a lot of denial, and we are not conscious enough about that kind of risk if we compare it to the risk of being sick or the risk of, of dying with the life insurance, for example. So the market for a private insurance system in that area is not very interesting, not very attractive. That, that's, that, that's why we don't have very good package for long-term care uh, insurance at the moment. So it's, it's really a, a public matter. Those kind of long-term care insurance should be universal, ideally with no means tests. It should be publicly funded. Capitalize, that's the ideal. But there is no system across the world that has been capitalized for the long-term care. So it's ideal because for an intergeneration equity, uh, it should be people that will benefit from uh, this insurance that should uh, contribute to, uh, to the funding. But it never happened like that. But ideally, we should capitalize. It should be a decentralized management. Uh, it should be based on the assessment of the needs. It should be neutral, no matter the dwelling you are living in. Uh, unique for all ages. You know, there are two kinds of systems. System uh, which are different from handicapped people to older people, like in France, for example. And there are some countries where it's uh, uh, one system, whatever the age. I think it's the the best is to have only one system, uh, but uh, it depends on the, uh, some, some of the context of the, of the country. And there should be a, an independent and protected funding for uh, that long-term care insurance. So the needs assessment, the best is to use the case manager as part of an integrated service delivery system. We implemented in, in Quebec the Prisma model, and it was the same experience in Japan. So that's the case manager who are responsible for assessing the needs and also for um, defining the service plan and uh, to, for coordinating uh, the, the service delivery standardized tool with uh, an eligibility criteria based on the, the standardized tool and uh, for valuing uh, rehabilitation and prevention, it's interesting to have longitudinal study and to, to, uh, to value the uh, improvement in, uh, in, uh, uh, in disabilities. The service plan should be developed by the case manager with the older people and the caregivers and a formal agreement of the older people and caregiver with the service plan and the case manager could also ensure the, the quality control and the follow-up of people. So the benefit from uh, this insurance, so you have assessed the needs, this needs corresponds to a package, a, a, a package of uh, a benefit, and you could use this, this package for receiving the services from uh, uh, the public organization, the public home care services or the nursing homes. So it's a kind of, uh, of activity-based financing for uh, those public organizations. You can use it by contract with non-for-profit organization from voluntary organization or for, from private organization, for example, in uh, residential facilities. And the third way is a cash for care. But there is some problems with uh, that way of uh, providing the benefit. Because in, in some countries, uh, it, uh, it, uh, th there was a development of a, a kind of gray market. In Italy, they call that the, the, the badenti, uh, those uh, immigrants for uh, most and uh, who are working uh, in in a gray area. Uh, so this is a, a pernicious effect. Uh, there could be also, it could be open to financial abuse, you know, the nephew take the check but do not provide services. 
it, it also confine the woman in a traditional role because usually it's women that are doing that. So by doing a, a cash for care, you are um, uh, fostering a traditional role for, for women. And you do not control the, the quality of uh, uh, the services and also the training of people providing the services. Even if they are informal caregiver, um, it's uh, very important for the quality to have an adequate training to be, uh, to be uh, acting uh, with, uh, with uh, quality. So we should limit the cash for care, I think, to special cases uh, and uh, there should be quality control procedures and social benefits that are associated with, with uh, uh, that uh, cash for care. You know, people, the, the main argument is uh, we are in a, an economic uh, context that is not very good and uh, it's uh, a new expenses. But, you know, there is a, a major, major return on investment. In the short term, we, we keep women at work because at the moment, women are obliged to leave their job to care for uh, a parent or a uh, an husband. And uh, this cost 500 million a year in Canada. And there's a, a very good study by Dossman and Janet Fast uh, with the Labor Force Survey that, that documented this cost for uh, the Canadian economy. And also when you invest in home care, you invest in job creation. Those people pay taxes those people buy goods and pay taxes again. And so there is a return, a direct return uh, on investment. On the medium term, you decrease the uh, undue hospital bed using by providing services at home. And you decrease also the need for nursing home beds. This is very costly. I'm gonna show you uh, in a minute what are the projected costs if we go on with the actual strategy of sending people to nursing home instead of investing in home care? There is a cost for that. And on the long run, we limit the cost of the aging of the population. We do not, you know, uh, abolish the cost of the aging of the population. There's going to be a cost for the aging of the population, but we decrease the, the, the projected cost of the aging of the population. So it was one of the reasons why I jumped into politics two years ago. And uh, we developed over the first month of my mandate uh, a, white paper, a white paper on uh, uh, the uh, autonomy insurance. This white paper, paper was uh, discussed in uh, parliamentary commissions. Uh, we, we've got 61 groups and a lot of uh, emails, letters, and so on, with a general support uh, for, uh, for that new innovation. The objectives of this autonomy insurance was to ensure an equitable public funding. So to get rid of the two-tier system. So every people in Quebec, whatever they live in the residential facilities, were eligible to receive the, uh, the autonomy insurance benefit. And we wanted to establish also a public management of long-term care. At the moment, people living, for example, in, in residential facilities are not covered by the, the public management. You know, those residential facilities have, the, are, have their, their own way to assess the needs and their own way of uh, uh, providing the services. People have to pay for that. And sometimes, you know, people are, are exploited for, uh, by uh, those facilities. And we wanted also to ensure the quality of services wherever the services are provided. So it was covering adults with permanent and significant disabilities, so older people and also handicapped people, covering all living environment, and it was a, a universal coverage. There was a, a means adjustment. People with, with low income would get more benefits uh, from uh, the insurance to, to help those people to uh, get more services for their disabilities. 
So there was an assessment by the case manager. The case managers are already in place in Quebec with the, the assessment tool that I mentioned to you. Uh, the benefit so were, was determined based on the assessment in hours of care or in dollars. Uh, and it was means adjusted, as I said. And there was a, an individualized service plan and a service allocation with a formal approval from the, the user, from the, the older people and their relatives. There was a contract with the service providers, so with the private or non-for-profit organization, with an accreditation process for accrediting the uh, providers for uh, ensuring the quality of, uh, of the services. And the follow-up and the, the quality control was supposed to be done by the case manager. The service covered uh, was professional care, so nursing, nutrition, psychosocial, rehab, but also the ADL support, the IADL support, the services to informal caregivers, so the respite services and the support services, and some of the technical devices. So in summary, you have the, the Centre de Santé de Services Sociaux, so uh, social and health centers uh, that are responsible for assessing the needs. So that's where the case manager are associated, planning the services, realize, realizing the, the service plan, coordinating the services and assessing the quality of services. Those centers provide directly the professional care and services, so it was a kind of activity-based funding that was implemented with this uh, autonomy insurance, but because at the moment it's a, an historical-based funding for those centers, so it's not based on the, the real activity provided by, by the centers. And the centers would be responsible for getting contract agreement with the, the private facilities or uh, what we call the social economy agencies, uh, uh, the private agencies, or uh, the voluntary organizations. And those providers were accredited by the regional health authority with uh, an, acc an accreditation process. Funding for that was uh, uh, get by transferring the actual long-term care budget into uh, protected envelope, adding the 500 million in the first year of our mandate, we, we put 100 million dollar, and we were planning to do that uh, every year for five years. And it was a specific budget program with a budget transfer forbidden in the organization. And afterward, after the $500 million, it would need $100 to $150 million to sustain the uh, insurance, the, the, the program, giving the aging of the population. So if you look at the projection, you have on that slide the budget for long-term care funding. In red, it's the projected budget from what we are doing now. So it means that from $6 billion, actually, we're going to be at 10, at $12.8 billion in 2027-28, uh, with the autonomy insurance system, it would cost the green line, so $11 billion in 27-28, and the, the blue line is the actual uh, budget allocation for long-term care, so that's the projection of uh, with the, the, the infl inflation, uh, what's going to be the actual budget. So you see that uh, there is a gap of $1.3 billion, and it means that every year we should increase the budget by uh, 100 to 150. So we know that, you know, the demography is 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 there so uh, we know that's going to cost that way but the good news is that we'll, we will save 1.5 billion dollar it's a lot of money for a province like uh, the province of quebec so we introduced the bill for uh, this autonomy insurance in december the 6th we were waiting for the parliamentary commission but you know uh, the election was triggered uh, in March uh, the 6th, and we were defeated in April the 7th, and the project was abandoned by the new Liberal government. So, I think the, the bill 
is dead, but the idea is not. Because we have to move there. If we project the long-term care public expenses in Canada from now to 2050, we will move from 1.2% of the GDP to somewhere over 3%. If we invest in home care, we can change that. We can make the transition between home care and institutional care. And if we, if we give people the freedom to choose how they, they, they want to get the services between home care and institutional care, guess what? They choose home care. And this is what, what will happen. And this will mean nearly 1% of GDP less in 2050. It's more than $3.3 billion in 2014 Canadian dollars. It's a lot of money. We have to move there. Is it too late? I don't think so. You know, the oldest system, like in Netherlands or Germany, were implemented when the population were younger than the Canadian population. And they did not capitalize. So it's, a, it's, not, it's not a strong argument. It's not because we have not capitalized 20 years ago that we cannot implement that kind of long-term care insurance. And the young, younger systems in France or in Japan were implemented when the population wa was older than our population. So it's not an argument. We have to move that. You know Tintin? Probably. You know, Tintin is now whole, but he dreams the times he was young. And th at that time, there was the implementation of the health insurance system. It was really the social innovation of the 20th century because it, it responded to the health needs of that time, you know, acute diseases and an hospital-centered system. But now Tintin is old and he needs a long-term care insurance system. It's going to be the social innovation of the 21st century. And it's the real response to uh, the new needs of the population, the new needs of chronic diseases, and the new needs of an home-centered system. Home care is what older people want. It's less expensive, and we got the higher quality of life by living at home. I strongly think that a public long-term care insurance is needed in Canada. We had the first attempt that was unsuccessful in, in Quebec for political reasons. But I think provinces should look at that kind of social coverage. And why not having a new Canada Act on long-term care? You know, it's at the federal level that the money is, and the needs are in the provinces. So why not Canada take the leadership in providing a new long-term care act and transferring to provinces for care, integrated care, home care, and implementing an autonomy insurance system all over Canada? I hope that at the federal level and uh, the election are next year. I hope that it could be, it could be uh, uh, discussed during the, the electoral campaign because that's what the Canadians need and that what is, uh, is uh, I think, uh, necessary, not only for providing good services, not only for getting back older people with the freedom of choosing where they want to live, but also for economic reasons, because we, we cannot afford to go on with the institutional solutions. So thank you for your attention. A very interesting uh, talk, Reja, and you uh, put out some really uh, thought-provoking provoking ideas. And, and as I was getting ready to say a few words earlier on when I heard Reja was coming to Hamilton, and I was thinking of what would be my starting line. And actually, Rejean already mentioned that, that home care and aging, and why should this matter? It should matter to us for many, many reasons. 
And in the context of Ontario, because many of us who are thinking about in the audience are probably thinking from the context of Ontario, uh, according to the Institute of Clinical Evaluative Sciences in 2012 in Ontario, that the most complex 10% of older adults account for 60% of our collective healthcare funding. But the other side of the equation is that the least complex, which is 50% of our older adults, account less than 6% 6, 6 of our collective healthcare spending. So many of those people are living in their own communities and in their homes. And, and wouldn't it be a wonderful idea to create a system that supports these people to stay in their homes and their communities as long as possible, not only to, uh, to think about how it benefits the economic aspects, but also how it provides dignity to the aging of the population. And in relation to aging and hospitalization, Idreja, you made a few comments about the, the how our systems are uh, set up. If we look at uh, aging of the population and hospitalization in Ontario, 42% uh, of the people uh, who uh, have no hospital episodes at all, they don't show up in that system. And cons consistently low users are something like 24 or 25%. Inconsistently, high users are around 6 to 7 percent, but consistently, high users are around 4 to 5 percent. So you can see acute care system doesn't meet the needs of the many people who need services in order for them to uh, stay in their home uh, own communities. So the, the, the majority of the things that defines high users versus low users, that the idea that the concept that Rejean presented here is looking at people who are able to live in their own communities and, and can function with some sort of, some sort of a social support uh, is that people who don't have many multiple chronic conditions. There's, they have conditions, but they're still able to function uh, in an independent fashion. They have a strong social support in some fashion, whether it's from home or their own caregivers, and they lack, uh, they don't have as much of a psychological frailty. So we have to think about how these people stay in their communities, how do we sort of make sure that they continue to be functionally independent, they continue to have a strong uh, social support system, whether it comes from a, some sort of organized system or for their own families, and, and they don't sort of experience some sort of a psychological frailty. So what are our options? And I think you laid out quite a few uh, ideas there, and I think we have no choice, and I think Rejan presented some numbers if we think about the senior strategy that was introduced in 2013 in, in Ontario, uh, one day in a hospital costs around $1,000 per person if they have to go into the healthcare system. One day in long-term care costs $130 per person. And one day in supportive housing or a home care or community care costs less than $50. So we, you can see that the, the economic math says that if we can keep people in their own communities as long as possible with the right structures and, and public systems, uh, we will actually have substantial savings in the healthcare system that, that, that can be redirected into other areas, especially where we are talking about complex care for some subset of the population as they age uh, would be a great idea. So I, I'm going to uh, now invite Melody to come to the table uh, to the chair here and present some of her thoughts on Rajan's uh, talk, and then we can open it up for uh, questions and answers. Thank you. Hey, good, good evening, everyone. My name is Melody Miles, and I'm the CEO of the Hamilton Niagara Haldeman Brandt Community Care Access Center. It's the uh, local CCAC, one of uh, 14 across the province. Last year, we provided care and support to more than 81,000 people of all ages across our region. I'm here as well on behalf of the Ontario Association of Community Care Access Centres, which is the umbrella organization for the province's 14 CCACs. The association provides shared services and helps the CCACs plan and advocate for a strengthened and streamlined sector for system change and increasingly for a better and bigger role for patients and caregivers in healthcare. Hence, OACCAC's partnership with the McMaster Health Forum on this talk 
and our work together engaging Ontario citizens on what they see as the challenges and opportunities for the future of health and home care in the province. I invite and encourage you to download the summary report from that dialogue. I think Mike indicated that earlier in his remarks. It's available on the McMaster Health Forum website, as well as the homepage of the OACCAC website. We need many voices. We need different expertise and a collaborative approach to change to provide greater access, quality, and value for public investment. Tonight we heard one of those voices, Dr. Bears, who shared his research expertise and his experience and his very interesting and innovative models of financing. I'm pleased and honored to have the opportunity to say a few words of thanks on behalf of all of us this evening, those in the room and those participating via the webcast. I want to thank you, uh, Rajan, for your presentation this evening, your passion to ensure appropriate integrated care for older adults with chronic and complex needs is very inspiring. I was particularly struck by your passion for and how close home care really is to your heart. That came, that was extremely evident to me. And I really appreciated the, uh, the mention of the importance of um, primary care and, uh, and uh, prevention and promotion and the importance that that brings to home and community care. Moreover, the fact that only 14% of expenses were devoted to home care is really telling. I appreciated your view, um, Rajan, that uh, home care must really become a right and not a privilege. It's gratifying to see that many of the elements of your proposed approach um, is ingrained really in the work that staff of Ontario's Community Care Act centres do each and every day. Our care coordinators, who are regulated health professionals, work with our patients, their families and other care providers to understand their health care needs, provide information about and referrals to services and supports in the community, and develop and adjust care plans to meet their changing care needs. We know that there are differences regarding how home and community care is funded and provided across Canada. But regardless of those models, it's abundantly clear that we are witness to a significant shift from acute to home care. The public is demanding it. Advancing technologies are enabling it. And our rising rates of chronic disease require it. We're, we also know that in order to make this shift, we need to have public dialogue, engaging families and caregivers. And of course, uh, all of our uh, planners and funders and decision makers. And of course, one of the biggest conversations we have to have as adults is the financing structure and the re expected return on investment. I want to thank you um, to obviously our, our esteemed uh, speaker, Rajan, and Parminder as well. And uh, everyone uh, in the audience this evening, I thank you for your, uh, for your interest in this really important dialogue for us. A few more important thank yous before I wrap up. Um, I want to, to the patients and the caregivers, with special acknowledgement to participants from this area who gave their time and energy, to the panel that uh, Mike and Parminder referred to uh, that was convened uh, at the end of August. We hope that uh, those individuals continue to be involved and, and stay in touch in these really important conversations. And to the McMaster um, Health Forum, I thank you for helping the OACCAC take its Health Comes Home discussion papers to the people that we serve, Ontario's patients and caregivers. We value our work together and we look forward to uh, continuing on with public talks and uh, the continued dialogues on the issues that really matter to Ontarians. And really not just Ontarians, I might add, but really all Canadians. Across Ontario, Community Care Access Centres are working with our patients and families, primary care, hospital and community partners, researchers and government to provide care in our communities. For those participating uh, this evening who may have questions about uh, the supports or the services that uh, certainly uh, Rajan had referred to in Quebec, but also that are available in Ontario, I would encourage you to contact your local Community Care Access Centre by calling our uh, toll-free number, 310-222 
um, and uh, CCA st staff are really available to speak with you 12 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. And uh, you can also find uh, more about uh, your local CCACs online at healthcareathome.ca. So I thank you for that, and now I'll, I'll uh, join the uh, group. So we have some time to take some questions. So if anybody, don't be shy. If you have questions, jump up to one of the two microphones, both in the aisle and up at front. Uh, if you want to ask something to one of uh, Rajan, Parminder, or Melody. And uh, we'll also be taking questions over Twitter if they come in. Do we have some? Or? Great. I'm Larry Chambers, um, Professor Emeritus at McMaster. Um, Rajan, you said that uh, political will was the, the, uh, the issue. Um, I'm now affiliated with the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, and uh, uh, I, I know in Parminder's presentation, uh, or in introduction, uh, he mentioned that you have spent a fair amount of time in your academic work uh, with dementia and epidemiology of dementia. Um, but um, on a political side, um, uh, we've just had the Minister of Health uh, meet with all the other ministers in Canada, provincial ministers, and came out of that meeting saying that there would be a national dementia plan. Um, I just wondered what, uh, we, have a, we have a sort of a, a pendulum goes back and forth in Canada. Sometimes we spend more time worrying about treating specific diseases and then other times just general health services. And I wondered if you could make any comments about uh, where you see dementia as a disease, as something that would, that, uh, would um, generate and mobilize political will uh, amongst the general population that maybe, maybe a long-term care insurance plan may not. Um, one last statistic which always uh, I think is important to remember is that uh, those long-term care beds you mentioned in Ontario now um, between 65 and 70 percent of those people have cognitive impairment. So, so it's really about uh, old age and dementia are entangled, as Margaret Locke would say. So, uh, any comments would be much appreciated. I thank you, thank you, uh, Larry, for the comment. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, the political support of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Is, uh, is growing, I must say, because I remember, you know, 20 or 30 years, and I'm sure you remember also, there was nobody, thought, you know, talking about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there was a kind of, uh, of uh, silence around that, that, that disease that is, and it's no longer the case, probably because uh, a lot of people have uh, uh, parents uh, uh, who have suffered from from these diseases, and it's no longer a taboo, uh, I think. And this is important for uh, a raising uh, awareness of, uh, of the public and also uh, the, the, the politicians. And I, I think uh, the Alzheimer's Society of Canada and, and others uh, should continue to, to sensitize uh, uh, people and politicians to the importance of that disease because, you know, uh, uh, this is the major cause of uh, disabilities in the uh, older people. And uh, when I, I talk about the long-term care insurance, in fact, the, the majority of, uh, of people who will benefit from that are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so it's, it's really uh, uh, entangled with, with, with aging, as you, as you said. Uh, but in my mind, uh, I think the politicians take the older people for given. And, you know, they do not really work to try to respond to the needs of older people. Uh, and uh, I'm, I think the new generation of older people will be much more difficult to, to, uh, to, uh, to to convince, to vote for a party that do not show um, some of their programs targeting uh, their, their specific needs. And I'm, uh, I'm hoping that it's coming in Canada, 
Um, but at the moment, you know, uh, when I see the, the past elections in Quebec and also in Canada, I don't see many, many topics specific to aging that are discussed by the politicians, by all, all the parties, in fact. Uh, and uh, I think it's time for, um, for um, uh, lobbying the, the different party about uh, the importance of responding to the needs of uh, uh, the older people. But because, you know, when you respond to the need of older people, you also respond to, to the caregivers and it's younger people that are caring for older people. So there is some political benefit. To, uh, to target that population, but it's not really happening in, in, uh, in Canada. J just an anecdote, uh, we regularly do poll, you know, in, in politics, and uh, usually in Quebec, the, uh, the, there are only 40% uh, of, uh, of the older population who are supporting the Parti Québécois, 60% support the Liberals. And uh, after the uh, the discussion about the autonomy insurance, white paper, and so on, the proportion just get the other way around. It means, it, it, it did not, you know, uh, change anything in the election, but it means that when you target the needs of the, po of the older population, you can have political benefits. And I think uh, the, the party should realize that and should realize that the uh, the uh, the older people are w will no longer be be uh, taken for 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 uh, given in uh, in uh, in an election. But in oui. continue. In, in relation to adding to that comment that that the, the, the demands and the needs in relation to the baby boomers is going to be very different. They are going to be they are politically much more savvy. They are highly educated and their needs are going to be heard loud and clear uh, politically. The question is how do you mobilize that group of the population at the citizen level to make some of these changes happen? Uh, there is a question, there are a couple of questions from Twitter. And first one is, Rejan, again to you, that th this, uh, this uh, particular uh, person didn't understand exactly what cash for care meant. Uh, please elaborate. In, in Germany, for example, uh, you, when you, you got disabled, you have an assessment and you then have a check, an amount, and you should use it, you, put, you could use it as you wish, you know, to give to your husband for uh, the services they, they give to you or to your daughter or to, your, to a private organization. That's what we, we, we call a cash for care. There is a cash money, a check that is given to the older, the older people. So there are many problems with that in, in Germany and in Italy, for example, because it's, you know, it opened the door for uh, financial abuse. Uh, it also, usually women that are gonna take the check to get the services, leaving their job uh, to care for their older people. So the traditional role of, of women is, is, uh, is ongoing. And uh, also, you, you do not have any, any control on the quality of the services and on the training of those people uh, giving the services. And in, in Italy, uh, they call those, those people, usually uh, illegal immigrants, uh, uh, the badenti. So it's a kind of gray market that, was, uh, that has been developed. So I think we should use that way of funding with the long-term care insurance system, uh, with cautious, uh, ensuring that the quality is there uh, and that social benefits are associated with the check because otherwise you will perpetuate the, the poverty of, uh, of older women when they, 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 they will get retired. So I'm going to pick up on a point that Larry Chambers made, my name is Susan Denberg, uh, about the pendulum swinging. And I'm, I'm really fascinated at the notion of home care and, and uh, autonomy. And I guess what I'm wondering, I would appreciate if, if Réjean could um, elaborate a bit on the Denmark system, because what I'm trying to struggle with, is this the shift in a sense of the threshold at which people might need institutional care? Or are we actually saying that almost anything that needs to happen to elderly people, if the service is right, can happen 
in residential home care settings. And I'll, I'll declare a conflict of interest here because I am, I work and volunteer in a local long-term care facility which struggles really to give quality at home service. And I'm thinking about the clients at long-term care and trying to picture them in any kind of home setting where there isn't the economy of scale of service and I'm taking for granted the efforts for quality and personalized service. So, and I know that doesn't exist in lots of places. But what I would hate to see happen is, is long-term care or so-called institutional care demonized in this context. And we have a pendulum swinging where there, you know, that's maybe not, con it's considered when you, a two-tier system in, in that that's the worst one you can be in, in contrast to a home-based system. So I can, I can fully appreciate increasing stay at home, providing services in residential settings, but I'm trying to picture how much of the real need of dementia patients can be accommodated in that context. It could be my ignorance. And so I'd really love to hear about a system, like you say in Denmark, where the services follow the people rather than people follow the services. And are we saying that home, how much of the system would home care replace? Okay. I. I I don't mean that uh, we will get rid of nursing homes. You know, there will there, there will be place. There will still be place for nursing homes for very disabled people uh, that we cannot care without an institutional setting. But a lot of people that are actually uh, in nursing homes could have been served at home with appropriate services, and that. Yeah, it's been yeah, it's a kind of threshold. You know, if you if you look at, for example, the the, the picture of uh, people uh, admitted in a nursing home in Quebec, for example, we we said that the the admission criteria is uh, being a, a, a profile 10 and over, 10 to 14. You know, that's the most disabled people. But you know, 40 to 45 percent of people living in nursing home at the moment do not have that kind of disability level. So they could have been uh, served at home or in residential facilities with adequate services. And that's this population that could benefit from an autonomy insurance system because you, you give them the choice. And when you give them the choice, they're going to choose to, to stay at home. And that's what, what happened in, in Denmark. Uh, I've been in Denmark, and it's amazing to see uh, how people with with uh, severe disabilities are still living at home or in residential facilities uh, with their own apartment with the appropriate services provided by the, the municipality or the voluntary organization or non-for-profit organization. Uh, it could be done. Uh, and uh, I think that's the, that should be the objective. Uh, in the meantime, we can maybe get to the, uh, the, the, the France or or Netherlands level, but you know it's better than the uh, the we we are the 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 the, uh, the last the last uh, in in the, in the classroom in the international classroom you know with 40 percent. No other countries is less than the, our 40 percent, and uh, it's because we use so far the institutional solution uh, for uh, solving that problem. It's it's a solution of the, of the uh, 19th century. It's the hospital solution for, uh, for people with disabilities, and we are still in, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, setting. Uh, we have to move. And I'm convinced, strongly convinced, that just putting more money is not enough. We have to make a significant change in the financial structure of long-term care, and that's why I'm I'm pledging for a long-term care insurance system. And if I can also just add then, it is about, it's about really identifying the right population who could benefit from those enhanced services that would happen outside of a long-term care home, as an example. And I think one of the other things that, that uh, I was thinking about as you were speaking is that sometimes we look at home care as an entity and then we look at, at, um, at long-term care. And it's sort of what's in between that. There are other supportive assisted living and supportive uh, uh, residential kinds of, um, of units that I think would add really add value. And this is why you're going to find across the 
across Ontario, there's a lot of attention to um, capacity planning and really looking at what are those other supports that can help that can help the home in the community setting. And um, because it is, not, not everybody needs to be in a long-term care home, and it's about who are those right people to be using that particular um, facility. And I would say that like dementia is, in fact, a population unto itself that does take right, some uh, very special uh, kinds of services around it. And, um, and, but I, I just really am focusing on the community capacity and the possibility there. You're raising a very, very important point. Long-term care is a continuum. At the moment, we look at home care on the side and institutional care. There is a continuum of different residential settings for providing services. And our way of funding at the moment is, uh, is fostering this, uh, this division between home care and institutional care and do not, do not foster the emerging, emerging new way of providing services, new way of, of, of uh, setting the, 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 uh, the, uh, the home of people. Uh, in other words, uh, if we give the people the opportunity to buy services, you're going to stimulate a new market. Uh, either private or non-for-profit market with innovative way of delivering services, innovating way of, of uh, providing uh, residential facilities to, uh, to people with disabilities. And uh, uh, this is the kind of uh, stimulation that we need at the moment because uh, we are really in a, in a, in a very rigid frame uh, with, uh, for providing long-term services. Rajan, just on the last point, when you were presenting this idea as a Minister of Health, did you come across the, the criticism that you are privatizing uh, part of this? Is that... Uh... Yeah, it was strange. The unions, in fact, uh, uh, said that I was privatizing services for the older people. And I said, hey, come on, look, the services are already provi uh, provided by, by private organization, but we have no control on that. They, they, they charge people what they want to charge. They assess people. Usually they don't assess people. They provide services even if it's not needed. Uh, we don't have any control on the quality. We don't have any control on the management of those services. And what I want to do is to, to get control, to, to get a public control, and second, a public financing for uh, those organizations. But there was some resistance by the unions who wanted to have a, a, a public system, uh, only the public system delivering services. But I said, no, it's not the reality. There is non-for-profit organization, there is voluntary organization, there is private organization providing f residential uh, care in, uh, in some facilities. So it's, it's already a public-private area. And we don't want to nationalize all the services for the older people. We want just to, to, to get back control, public control and public funding for the services. So there's another question from the Twitter, and this question is, uh, Rajan, directed at you as well. Uh, what can we do as citizens to get traction on this issue? <laughs> In uh, 120 ca characters? <laughs> yeah, that's a Twitter response. <laughs> <laughs> a Twitter response. You have to talk to your MP, I think, and you have to raise that point in a political campaign. I think. It should, be, it should be raised on the public area, and uh, we have to talk about it. There's another question. Hello, my name is Caroline Gill. I come from the service provider side of uh, things uh, from CBI Home Health, providing services in 13 of the 14 CCACs. I rarely go to a talk and actually have nothing to disagree with the speaker, so I thank you for that. Um, so many of, uh, of your points resonated, uh, having spent uh, more than 50% of my career in, in the home care sector. 
Here in Ontario, um, the CCACs, along with their partners, the service provider organizations, have absolutely transformed over the past several decades from uh, you know, starting with divestment in the 1990s, going through to where we are today and having developed a, a quality-based platform. And we've done that with um, paltry funding, uh, inadequate funding, less than sustainable funding. So I have huge confidence in the home care sector in Ontario that if we got adequate funding that was sustainable, the training, the investment in home health, um, health human resources, the, um, the ability to maintain so many more of those people at home for a longer period of time, like Melody says, it might be that they need to go into something else in time or, or, or into long-term care, at the, perhaps at the end. Um, so I think that we've continually proven in Ontario home care sector that we can do it, and we can do it with so little that I just wonder, very similar to that Twitter question, except I've taken more than 140 characters, is what is the burning platform that we need to say, move on now because the economic argument is very strong. The will of the Canadians is extremely loud. That's where they want to be. So, like, it's a no-brainer. No-brainer, you're right. <laughs> you're right. Uh, two points. Um, uh, the, the, the first one is, you know, I talked about the freedom. At the moment in Quebec, uh, I think people, older people are suffering from the the tyranny of the organization. It's the organization, the Centre the Santé de Services Sociaux, that decide for their life how they're going to get the care, at what point they're going to have to move to uh, uh, an intermediate facility or to move to a nursing home. Uh, we have to get rid of that, I, I think. It, it's very, it's, it's critical. For uh, a developed country like we are, I think it's unacceptable that older people don't don't have the choice to decide where they want to live and by whom they want to be cared. Second, we implemented, and I, I worked for 10 years in, uh, in developing the models of integrated care with, uh, with case managers that are responsible for coordinating the care. And, you know, the, the case manager told me, you know, we have to coordinate care, but there is no care available. And if you give to the case manager a budget envelope to, to, uh, to get the appropriate services, you give them a leverage, which is very important to get the appropriate services for the right person at the right place in the right time. And uh, it's, I think it's a, it's a strong incentive to be able to organize the care with the, the most appropriate services for for, uh, for people, and that's what could happen with uh, an autonomy insurance. So uh, I used to, to, to say that with the Prisma model, there is six elements, you know, the coordination, the uh, unique entry point, the, uh, uh, assess the unique assessment tool, the case manager, the, the service plan, and the information system, but there is a seventh one, which is the funding, and uh, I think it's essential to uh, ensure a good coordination of care and to lever the role of the case manager uh, to raise the appropriate services uh, that are needed for uh, the older people. We know yeah. that at the end of the day, we're talking about people, aren't we? And this is about the, the, the patient experience. And I think if we just remember that's at the center of everything we do every single day, there's a person there. And it's about getting that right care for that, right, for that person at that right time in that right place. And we owe it. We owe it to Ontarians and Canadians to make that happen. Uh, any other questions? Um, yeah. The photographer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm the local franchise owner for uh, Home and Said Senior Care. Um, like I said, it was a great talk. I appreciate um, your willingness to partner with not only public funded, but also private pay organizations, as I think that's going to be a big deal moving forward. Um, my question would be more around, you mentioned most of the CCAC funding goes towards a medical need. Um, with a lot of the patients we care for with dementia, Alzheimer's, it's a lot of those other home care tasks 
that end up falling behind and that's generally what makes them make the move to long-term care in a lot of scenarios? Do you think that we're missing the boat kind of on some of those home care tasks like the meal preparation, light housekeeping, things like that? I, I think the, this kind of funding is, is not really medical and that's the problem, you know, uh, because uh, if it's medically necessary, you're gonna get it. It's included in the, in the health insurance. We are talking about, you know, services to, to help people uh, feeding and uh, uh, washing and uh, cooking and so on and so forth. So it's a fundamental uh, support to the autonomy of people. And it's not really medical, you know, the, the cause of that could be one disease or another, Alzheimer's disease or arthritis and, and so on and so forth. The result of that, the consequences of the disease is the disability. And we should focus on disability and that's another transformation we have to make with the aging of the population. Instead of focusing diseases, we have to foc focus on consequences of diseases on, the, on the, the functioning of people, and that's disability. So we should focus on disability, and that's why we should support people in getting services for supporting uh, the autonomy. And that's why we have to move from a health insurance to a long-term care insurance system. And that's the, that's inevitable in the demographic transformation we are, we are in the moment. Uh, great, thank you very much. I think uh, we have come to the end of our, this session. I just wanted to say that in relation to the last comment that yes, aging of the population itself brings some of the medical issues, but more importantly, aging the population first and foremost is a social issue, and we have to think about it as a social issue. Thanks, Perminder. And I just wanted to say, on behalf of the McMaster Health Forum, just thank you very much, Rajon, for coming and giving what I thought was a very compelling talk, and I thought it was quite interesting. So thanks again.